Saturday Morning Physics is sponsored by the M. Lewis Tiffany Endowment, the Hideko Tomazawa Endowment, the Physics Department, and by gifts from friends of the program. talk about what the Large Hadron Collider, or LHC for short, is good for, at least from my perspective, the perspective of a young particle theorist. So first of all, what is the LHC? Most importantly, it's the world's largest particle collider. <clears throat> It'll help us to answer the question, what are the most fundamental or elementary constituents of matter, and what laws govern their behavior? So more on this in a bit. But first, I want to briefly introduce you to the LHC, a very impressive machine in its own right. Uh, by the way, I should tell you uh, that I don't work on this experiment directly. Professor Jean Ming Chen does, uh, and he'll, be, he'll tell you more about this very impressive machine two weeks from today at the Saturday morning physics lecture. So the Large Hadron Collider at CERN spans a region at the French-Swiss border uh, near, near Geneva. So here in this photo is Lake Geneva. So this is an overhead photo uh, of the region below which there's a circular 17-mile uh, long tunnel in which two beams of charged particles are sent around at nearly the speed of light in opposite directions. <clears throat> the particles are either protons or lead ions. And in fact, during most of the runtime at the LHC, uh, it's going to be protons are, are what are sent around the ring. Uh, and in fact, proton collisions are what I'm going to focus on today. So protons, as you may recall, are positively charged particles that, when packed together densely in neutrons, form, uh, sorry, when packed together uh, densely with neutrons, so the little orange things in this uh, cartoon, form the nuclei of atoms. Um, and the proton beams collide a few places around the, the ring. The collision regions, uh, so at CERN, there's four collision points. And around these points where the, the collisions happen, there are large uh, cylindrical detectors that serve as sort of the eyes that see the remnants of the collisions. So the LHC is the main project at CERN right now. CERN is a joint European laboratory that's uh, somewhat like the national labs in the US, but it was begun and supported by a host of European countries. And just as researchers from institutions in other countries participate in many of the experiments going on at the national labs in the US, uh, many non-EU researchers participated in the LHC experiments. Indeed, researchers from US institutions are highly involved in the LHC experiments. So back to protons. Protons are subatomic particles. And here I've got a cartoon um, of a helium atom. It shows that protons, so here's a proton, for example. Protons and neutrons make up the dense nucleus of an atom. It also shows that the proton is something like uh, a trillionth of a millimeter in diameter. And that there's uh, this, this little cartoon also shows that there's structure within the proton. Uh, in fact, protons are made up of quarks, which are held together by uh, the so-called strong force. It's important to know that the most interesting collisions that happen at the LHC uh, it's important to know that the most interesting collisions uh, in, part, in proton colliders don't just result in the protons uh, being busted apart or like bumping off of each other. They result in elementary particles within the protons um, actually annihilating or disappearing and giving their energy up to the for, uh, so that new, completely different particles are formed. So these are not your ordinary collisions. <laughs> 
As we'll discuss, uh, the remnants of these collisions, which are usually exotic particles that exist for only moments before they decay into other particles, um, will help us to answer the central question in elementary particle physics. So a little more about the LHC. Uh, it became the world's highest energy collider in November of 2009. In fact, it took the world record for highest energy collisions from the Tavatron, which I'll talk a little more about later. So the LHC ran from uh, March, 2000 to, uh, March to November 2010 at a 7 TeV center of mass energy. And a tera, electro, a tera electron volt, or TeV for short, is just a unit of energy. It's about the kinetic energy or energy of motion of a flying mosquito. Uh, so that may seem really unimpressive at first look. Uh, but the point is that all of that energy is concentrated in the collision of two protons, two tiny subatomic objects. Uh, that energy is squeezed into a volume more than a trillion times smaller than the mosquito. So that's what's impressive about it. <clears throat> uh, so how do you make two minuscule objects collide? It's, kind of, it's a problem kind of analogous to firing two rifles towards each other and having the bullets hit. <laughs> The protons are sent uh, in bunches of billions, squeezed into a beam about a third the width of a typical human hair, um, near the points where they collide at least, uh, with the beams moving in opposite directions. And remember, both beams are moving actually at nearly the speed of light. So the LHC started up again earlier this month, and it's going to run through the end of 2000. 12 at the 7 TeV center of mass energy with a brief shutdown at the end of 2011. And during that time, the LHC experiments will record more collisions than the previous state-of-the-art accelerator experiments at Tevatron have collected over the last decade or so. So collecting a large amount of data is actually crucial to discovering new physics. So the LHC is not only good at high energy collisions, but it's also good at producing lots of collisions and being able to record them. Um, so in fact, the LHC was designed to run at twice the center mass energy that it's running at this year. And it'll shut down at the end of 2012 to get a big machinery upgrade that'll allow the larger energies. <clears throat> so the main experimental collaborations at uh, the LHC are CMS and ATLAS, so there are these uh, experiments associated with these big detectors that sit at two of the collision points. So CMS is on, is right here on the screen, and then Atlas sits on the main CERN campus, or under the main CERN campus, if you will. So these detectors, CMS and Atlas, are like these big eyes that can observe uh, the collisions, or remnants of the collisions. Let me just say, a little about the two experiments. They're very impressive. Uh, so this is a, a photo of CMS before it was lowered underground to go um, to be around the collision point. So it's, it's uh, 49 feet in diameter, which is just about exactly the width of this hall. Um, it's 70 feet long, so the cylinder is 70 feet long, which is a little less than one and a half times the the depth of this lecture hall. And it also weighs 14,000 tons, which is uh, about the weight of 247 jets. It's a huge, huge thing with lots of material. Uh, it also has, so the experiment also has a lot of researchers working on it. There's about 3,000 members from almost 200 institutions around the world from 38 countries. And this is a photo of Atlas and on. So Atlas is even bigger than CMS in size. It's 82 feet in diameter, which is a little more than uh, three times as, if you were standing next to it, it would be a little more than three times as tall as, as this lecture hall. Um, it's 148 feet long, which is like three times the depth of this lecture hall. Uh, and it, uh, although it does weigh half half of what CMS weighs. It's only 7,000 tons. Um, <laughs> so, and it also, the collaboration also has a similar number of researchers working on it. 
Uh, I, in fact, had the opportunity to uh, see the Atlas Hall before the, the, experiment, the detector was lowered down there when I visited CERN as a summer student in 2003 after my junior year of college. Uh, my summer ex student experience was wonderful, informative. Not only did I get excited about French croissants while I was there, uh, but I also got excited about elementary particle physics. Uh, I gained knowledge about particle physics from the lectures I attended, uh, and more importantly, from my actual research exper experience with the accelerators group there. I also made physics friends from various places in Europe and from places farther away like South Africa, Tunisia, and New Zealand. It's a very uh, exciting place to be at CERN. Um, so I actually went through an NSF-sponsored so-called REU program that was run by Northeastern University. <clears throat> and that program doesn't exist anymore, but the University of Michigan still runs a very successful summer student program that sends uh, several undergrads every year to this CERN summer school. So it's, it's a very nice program. Excuse me. So I hope that you're impressed with the colossal nature of the LHC. And furthermore, I hope that you can feel proud of the technologi technological, political, and intellectual achievement represented by the LHC that was only possible with the support of us as a society. A lot of resources, including human labor, leadership, brain power, money, had to be dedicated in order for this to succeed. It's awesome that countries in the EU came together to start the project, and that by now hundreds of institutions from 38 countries have joined in to make it happen. <clears throat> We've come together in pursuit of an answer to the age-old question, what are we made of? What are the smallest parts, and how wide are they so? And we Michiganders can feel especially proud of the University of Michigan as a leader within the Atlas collaboration at CERN. <clears throat> so you might rightly ask, why does the LHC have to be so colossal, and do we really need it? <laughs> I'll spend the rest of my hour giving some answers to these questions, as well as giving you a feel for how we can use the LHC to answer our questions on the fundamental nature of, of matter. And the first part of the answer is that many kinds of elementary particles exist in the universe that don't exist naturally on Earth. The only way we can study these exotic particles in a controlled environment on Earth is if we create them. <clears throat> so it turns out that some exotic particles are actually created in hot spots within the universe today, like the center of our galaxy or in stars. And uh, some observations of these exotic particles can be made in detectors on Earth that can observe the remnants of cosmic rays. Cosmic rays are just very high energy particles uh, from space that collide with particles in our atmosphere. Um, so this point about space-based natural accelerators should remind us of one of the reasons we're interested in these exotic particles in the first place. They are fundamental constituents in the universe. Uh, in particular, exotic particles played important roles in the very, very early universe when particles were zipping around at very high energy in close proximity. So if we'd like to truly understand our origins, we also need to understand um, high energy physics. So you may have heard that we have now overwhelming evidence that the universe has been expanding throughout history. And if we trace back to early times, we come to a moment when the density of the universe is incredibly high. We often refer to this moment as the Big Bang. <clears throat> and I've displayed here a cartoon of the history of our universe. As you move from left to right, um, so as you move from left to right, time increases. And you can see this scale is kind of strange. Uh, we're only at 10 to the minus 10 seconds here, 10 to the minus 5 seconds, 100 seconds. And then at the end of the plot, we get to today. So there was a lot of interesting stuff uh, happening just in the first less than a second after the Big Bang. And it's particularly interesting to note 
that the typical energies of the collisions of um, elementary particles in the universe um, very early on were, tip were uh, similar to the energies of the LHC collisions. And that, so the time corresponding to that is uh, less than a billionth of a second into the universe's history. So in some sense, uh, we're recreating the conditions just after the Big Bang in accelerators like the LHC. So back to the justification of big accelerators. Why does it have to be so big? Uh, an advantage, well, I should say, an advantage of human-made particle accelerators, um, an advantage that they have over nature-made accelerators in space is that human-made particle accelerators allow for very well-controlled experiments. So for one thing, you know what you collided together in the first place. Uh, but why do they have to be so big and expensive? Why do you have to have such a large accelerator ring? Uh, so the first part of the answer is that we're looking for the smallest, most basic constituents of matter. And quantum mechanics tells us that probing small length scales requires higher energy. So to achieve high energy collisions, uh, the protons have to be moving very fast. That's just a fact. Um, and the current mechanism used to pump energy into collisions is to accelerate charged particles with electric and, so charged particles with electric and magnetic fields. The elec electric fields are used to speed the particles up, the magnetic fields to bend them in a circle and to focus them in a small beam. Uh, and the advantage, by the way, of spend, sending the particles in a circle is that you can speed them up sort of gradually, giving them pushes as they go around the ring many times. So if Monica will help me, just got a little demo. It's a mini accelerator of electrons in front of here. And um, right here I have a magnet. So this device is accelerating char uh, electrons, which have a negative charge. And if I put the magnet near um, the beam, then you can see, I think, that the beam bends. So this is, in fact, the, essentially the mechanism that's used in the LHC to uh, get the protons to move in a circle. And so, Right, we're now arguing why this accelerator ring has to be so big. It turns out that the larger the radius of your, your accelerator ring and the stronger the magnetic fields you have, then the greater the speed of your protons. And we're looking to speed our protons up as, as fast as we can. Um, so that means you can't increase the energy of your collision without either increasing the size of your ring or inventing new magnet technology. So, so this is the limit, the limitation. It also explains uh, why we want the LHC ring to be so big. So before moving on to more detail on what we're trying to find at the LHC, let me say a bit more about where my research fits in <coughs> to the field of particle physics. So the field within physics whose central question is more or less what are the fundamental constituents of matter and what laws govern their behavior is known as particle physics or as is a more popular way to call it these days, high energy physics. <clears throat> Again, there's an inverse relationship between length scales that can be probed and energy scale. So that's why it's high energy physics. And I'd say that folks are sort of moving away from the word particle because that word is not agnostic enough. We don't want to limit, um, we don't want the particle concept to limit our imagination in answering this central question. So folks within high energy physics attack this central question from a variety of angles, ranging from, I would say, experimental to theoretical. And within high energy physics, um, Phenomenologists, people who work on phenomenology, are essentially theorists 
who more or less construct bridges between theory and experiment. For example, uh, starting with a given theory, a phenomenologist might calculate what experimentalists would hope to or would observe in the data they collect if the theory were correct. And since I've arrived at Michigan, I've been a phenomenologist. And the projects I've been working on have been motivated by the LHC and the Tevatron. I've already talked about the LHC, so let me say a bit more about the Tevatron, which is also a remarkable machine. Then I'll go on to set more context for um, possible discoveries at the LHC, as well as talk about my work within particle physics, which I hope will give you a more concrete idea of how accelerators are used <clears throat> and to help us uncover the fundamental building blocks of nature. So the Tevatron, like the LHC, is a machine that pumps energy into particles as they zoom around in a large ring and eventually collide uh, with high energy. The Tevatron collides protons and antiprotons as they zoom around this uh, four-mile ring in opposite directions at nearly the speed of light. The beams of protons and antiprotons are crossed in several places around the ring where detectors sit, just like at the LHC. And I sh you might be curious to know why it's called the Tevatron. Uh, it's actually just be it's because uh, the ener typical energies of the collisions are on the order of one TeV, so Tevatron from TeV. And up to a year or so ago, it was the highest energy accelerator in the world. Uh, also, as many of you may know here, we're, we're very close to the Tevatron. Uh, it's, a, it's a major project of the National Lab about 20 miles north of Chicago called Fermilab. So physicists first observe, uh, observed the first proton-antiproton collisions produced by the Tevatron uh, in 1985. And also the main experiments um, at, uh, attached to the main detectors on the ring uh, are called CDF and D0. They, those, uh, so those detectors began operating, as far as I understand, in 1992. And then in March of 1995, um, Physicists at CDF and D0 announced the discovery of the top quark, which was one of the main goals of, of those experiments. And Michigan, in fact, plays a very strong role in the CDF collaboration. So <clears throat> I said that many kinds of matter exist in the universe that don't exist naturally on Earth and that the only way we can study them in a controlled environment on Earth is if we create them. So what are these exotic kinds of matter? We, in fact, have a mathematical model that incorporates all of the fundamental particles that make up Earth matter uh, or that have been observed in particle detectors. So this model is called the standard model of particle physics, and it includes the following irreducible, at least so far as we can tell, um, constituents. There are quarks and leptons. Both of these are kinds of fermions, um, and quarks and leptons make up, I should say, ups and downs, and electrons uh, are the main substance of atoms. Uh, and what's this neutrino? Neutrinos, for example, are often released uh, in the process of nuclear decay. So as I think I mentioned before, up and down quarks make up uh, protons and neutrons, protons and neutrons make up the nucleus of atoms, and then electrons uh, are, are the other constituents in, in atoms. So a sort of strange thing about uh, the standard model is that, <clears throat> oddly enough, it turns out that there are uh, two more copies of this so-called first generation of quarks and leptons. Um, so the, the, the second and third generations are actually identical to the first, except they have different masses. So on the lepton side, in the second generation, you've got a muon and a muon neutrino, and then the third generation, a tau and a tau neutrino. Um, so the muon, for example, is basically a copy of the electron, but it's got a much larger mass. And then on the quark side, 
In the second generation, you have this so-called charm quark, which is a copy of up, but with larger mass, and a strange quark, which is a copy of the down, but with larger mass. And in the third generation, you've got a top quark and a bottom quark. <clears throat> um, so it turns out that only the members of the lightest generations of the fermions are stable. Uh, there's a slightly different story about neutrinos, but I won't talk about that. Uh, and <laughs> members of the heavier generations decay within small fractions of a second into members of, of the lighter genera lightest generation. So there are also particles associated with all the forces that play important roles uh, at the atomic and subatomic levels. Um, so so the, those particles include the photon, which is the force, force carrier of the electromagnetic force, uh, the W and Z bosons, which are force carriers for the weak force. The weak force is important, for example, in nuclear decay and they're, they're massive, unlike the photon. Uh, and then there's also the strong force, which holds uh, quarks together in the proton, for example, and the force carrier of the strong force is known as the gluon, because so it kind of glues the quarks together. Okay, so the standard model uh, the standard model incorporates in a mathematical framework all these particles, all of which we've observed. Uh, finally, there's a particle that many of you have probably heard about called the Higgs boson, uh, and the Higgs is crucial to the mathematical consistency of the standard model given that the fermions and the W and Z bosons have mass. And also, as you may know, the Higgs has not yet been observed. In fact, a large motivation for the LHC is its ability to discover the standard model Higgs. So I also wanted to say that, um, so a primary goal of particle physics isn't just to catalog all these irreducible, irreducible particles, but it, more importantly, perhaps, it's to understand how these particles fit together in a unified theory. Um, and the standard model is pretty good at doing this, but it's got some big holes. And the holes are more or less involve the fact that there's missing stuff, and there's also questions that the standard model leaves unanswered. So missing stuff includes, as I've mentioned, the Higgs in some sense. So and it's an, the Higgs is an essential part of the standard model, but it's not yet been observed. There's also dark matter, which we've observed uh, indirectly through astrophysics experiments, uh, but it's not encompassed in the standard model. And finally, um, I left out gravity in my list of forces, which we, we've observed, right? Uh, but it turns out that it can't be incorporated uh, into the standard model. So there's, there's some other questions that the standard model doesn't answer, including why are there three generations? Um, why the pattern of masses? Uh, and there's, there's other questions which uh, are somewhat more technical that, we're, um, that we'd like to be able to answer. And also, uh, an exciting thing about the LHC is that it's, it's where the LHC is colliding uh, protons at energies we've never uh, collided protons at before, so it could be that things yet unimagined await us at the high energy frontier. And from my perspective, this is probably the most exciting possibility. <coughs> okay, so speaking of this pattern of masses, uh, the pattern of masses of the leptons and quarks is, is quite strange and unexplained, so here I've got a chart where I've got a different um, unit for, for the mass. So the electron is the lightest fermion, except for the neutrinos. So if we call that one, you can see that the muon is 200 times heavier, the tau 3,600 times heavier, uh, and so on. So that's uh, over here I've got 
uh, a series of spheres that represent the various uh, fermions and also the W and the Z bosons. Um, so here, the, if, the electron, if the electron is represented by this ball bearing, <coughs> uh, then the volume of the larger spheres is in the same relationship as the mass of these particles to the mass of the electron. In other words, the sizes of these objects represent the masses of, of the uh, elementary particles. So it's not the size of the particles, it's their masses. Uh, but I, I have these out so that you can sort of see the strange, the large variety in sizes of the uh, masses of the particles. Um, and so maybe I'll, so here's the electron, then we have the up, down, strange, muon, charm, tau, bottom. Uh, w and Z bosons have about the same mass. And then over here, uh, we have the top quark. So it's, it's not really understood why the top quark, for example, is so much heavier than, than the other particles. And um, <clears throat> so just comparing its, its uh, sibling, the bottom quark, the top quark is, is much more massive. Um, so, in fact, it was a, a, a bit of a surprise in 1995 when the Tevatron found the top quark and measured its mass to be so large. <clears throat> um, and in the last six months, while I've been here at Michigan, I've focused on the top quark as a promising possible locus of new physics. Why is that? Well, by virtue of its large mass and its recent discovery, it's the least well studied of the so far discovered elementary particles. Uh, and also, excitingly, there's very recent evidence from, the, from CDF at Tevatron that the top quark has some properties that are inconsistent with the standard model. Um, and the, me the measurement that manifests that inconsistency it is called the top forward backward asymmetry, which I'll talk a little about now. So what is the, the <clears throat> top forward backward asymmetry? So as I mentioned, the Tevatron is a proton anti-proton machine. So um, you can define, for example, the a forward direction as the direction of an incoming proton in a collision, and you can define the backward direction as the direction that the incoming antiproton is moving in. Uh, and then it turns out that Tevatron energies are high enough to sometimes allow for a top anti-top pair to be created. Uh, and in one out of about every 10 billion proton antiproton collisions, a top uh, top anti-top pair is produced. Uh, and it turns out the experiment observes something like 400 collisions per second. And in those collisions, they've identified 1,000 or so top quark uh, pairs, top quark events. So one thing we can observe uh, is how often the top quark goes in the forward direction as opposed uh, to the backward direction. In this cartoon, I've shown the possibility of the top quark or what I've shown here is the top quark uh, ends up going in the forward direction and the anti-top in the backward direction. So this top forward backward asymmetry is just defined as uh, the number of events in which the top quark went in the forward direction minus the number of events in which it went in the backward direction, then divided by the total number of events. So for example, um, if the top went forward just as as, as much of the time as it went backward, the asymmetry would be zero. So it turns out that, this, uh, that in the standard model, this asymmetry is expected to be very small. Um, it's supposed to be something like 0 0.09, but the asymmetry was recently measured um, within the yeah, very recently, within the last couple months, to be much larger than the standard model admits. So they measure 
that the asymmetry is about 0.48. So CDF at Tevatron has found slightly more than a three sigma discrepancy between the standard model prediction and the measurement. So assuming that both the errors on the, the measurement and um, the prediction were properly accounted for, a three sigma discrepancy <clears throat> uh, amounts to there being about a 0.3 chance that, this dis that the discrepant measurement is just a statistical anomaly. So uh, the important thing to know is this is a very significant disagreement. Um, Whenever an experiment yields a result that appears to disagree with the standard model, that's very interesting. That's because remarkably, out of thousands of similar particle collider measurements, only a few disagree with the standard model at a level nearly as significant as the CDF measurement. So in this, and in this respect, that the, the standard model has been very successful. It's, it's remarkably robust. At the same time, we know that there's something beyond the standard model, and any anomalous measurement like this is a potential clue. So what might cause this large observed asymmetry? Um, well, my collaborators and I, in addition to many other particle theorists, have thought about this pretty carefully. And the basic conclusion is that, accepting, of course, our lack of creativity, there's really only a few classes of models that can produce this large asymmetry effect. So one involves uh, introducing a new particle that's uh, like a gluon, except it's massive, and it also has some strange um, couplings to quarks. So, a, a, and the name of this extra particle is often called the axi-gluon. Um, and one also, in, uh, another class of models that can explain the asymmetry involves introducing a new particle that couples directly to a top quark and a light quark, like an up or a down. And these kinds of models are called top flavor violating models. <clears throat> so it turns out that the second kind of model generically leads to a distinctive signature at the, the LHC, so a model that describes this anomalous measurement at the Tevatron leads to an interesting signature uh, at the LHC. So some of my recent work with collaborators here at Michigan points this signature out and describes a procedure for finding the signature in LHC data. Uh, it also estimates how long it will take the LHC to discover such models if they're correct. So what do I mean by signature? Well, what's seen in modern particle detectors is not the elementary particles themselves, unfortunately. Uh, so I want to spend a little time now discussing uh, what's actually seen in the detectors at the LHC and to give you an idea of what goes into an analysis of LHC data. So as I said, unfortunately, the detectors aren't quite sophisticated enough to be able to light up blue when a top quark comes through, or to flash red when a tau lepton appears. <clears throat> the kinds of things that can be seen directly by the detector are quite limited. However, as we'll br briefly discuss, it is possible to reconstruct a complicated chain of events in the detector using some well-established principles of physics. And one thing that phenomenologists like, like me do is to help experimentalists figure out how to best distinguish one theory from another through reconstructing these detector level events. Okay, so let's take a closer look at the Atlas detector. So this is a detailed uh, engineer's drama, drawing of Atlas. At first glance, you might think it looks a lot like a car engine or something, but if, oops, but if you look closely, these are people here. <laughs> It's, it's not an engine. <laughs> so what, what I want you to notice in this drawing is that the detector is a kind of cylinder with trackers or pixel detectors in the uh, inner layers and so-called calorimeters in the outer layers. So the inner layers help detect with very fine resolution when a charged particle 
uh, goes through that part of the detector. And then the outer layers are de designed uh, to record the energy of the particles that make it to these outer layers of the detector. <laughs> so very roughly, <laughs> uh, I've got a little schematic of a cross section of a detector. And so on the inner part, you've got a pixel detector or tracker, and the outer layers are calorimeters. So if it, oops, as a charged particle goes through, it leaves a track, and then it deposits energy in the, the calorimeters, um, which, the, which are recorded. So here's an actual event display from an event that occurred uh, about a year ago at Atlas. And you can see they um, set, there were many charged particles that left tracks in the, in the inner layers of the detector. And then these yellow and green blips out here are, represent deposits of energy that were made. So since it's Saturday morning, we have to watch at least one cartoon. And this is a cartoon of uh, a proton collision in Atlas. So here we're going down the beam pipe. We just crossed the French-Swiss border. Uh, that's an artist's conception of a proton with quarks inside. We're nearing uh, the collision point now. This is Atlas. Uh, the proton coming from the other direction, you can see it. There's a collision and a bunch of charged particles were produced left tracks and uh, energy deposits in the outer calorimeter. I did not make this animation. This I pulled off of the, this was uh, some hard worker at Atlas. <laughs> okay, so, so using the information about uh, the curvature of the paths that the particles um, make in the inner detector, uh, and the pattern of the showers that they leave in the calorimeters, there's basically six kinds of objects that can be identified in detectors. So, um, and then for these objects, the energy and a few other properties of, of them are, are recorded. So the basic objects that can be identified are this is a, sim a somewhat simplified view, but it's basically correct. So you can identify electrons and positrons, muons and anti-muons, photons, jets, which are basically remnants of a quark, B jets, which are uh, remnants of a B quark, and uh, this so-called missing energy. Um, missing energy is just, if you, if you believe that so we have good reason. It's a well-established law of physics that uh, momentum and energy are conserved. And so this missing energy is just uh, what's left over after you've counted, counted the uh, momentum and energy of the particles that left um, signatures in your detector. OK. So uh, here's an example of how to translate between a theoretical signature and a detector level signature. For example, to identify a top quark, uh, we note that a top decays to a W boson and a B quark 100% of the time, basically. Uh, and then a W will decay to either two quarks or an electron, electron neutrino, a muon, a muon neutrino, or tau, or tau neutrino. Uh, and so if this event happened in your detector, here's what you'd see. You'd see one B jet from the decay of the top, and either two non-B jets if the W decays to two quarks, or an electron or a muon with missing energy. So neutrinos uh, are neutral particles. They don't leave tracks, and they also um, don't leave energy deposits in the calorimeters. So they show up as missing energy. 
So what you'd see in the detector is those objects, such that the energies and the momenta of the objects added together yield an energy and a momentum uh, consistent with that of a top quark that decayed to a W and a B. Uh, this uses Einstein's famous relation, E equals MC squared. Uh, and so when this happens, we say that the objects in the event reconstruct a top. <clears throat> so and here's an example of a chain of events that we expect to happen every so often. If an X particle, which I'm, that's the name I'm giving to a particle that's, uh, we're, that's been proposed to help explain the forward-backward asymmetry uh, at the Tevatron. So if this X particle were to exist, then we'd expect every so often the proton and proton and the LHC would collide and a top quark and this X particle would be produced. Then the X would decay very quickly to an anti-top and a quark. So the theoretical signature is that you'd find or that you have a top and anti-top and a quark such that the energies and momenta of the anti-top and the quark reconstruct an X particle. And at the detector level, what you'd see is two B-flavored jets from the decays of the tops um, and either three non-B jets from decays of W bosons and one lepton and missing energy or and then there's several other possibilities. Um, so you'd observe those objects such that the energies and the momenta of those objects added together in some combination reconstruct the top uh, and the X particle. <clears throat> so it can, I've, I've sort of simplified this, the, the scenario a little bit here, but it can be a real challenge to pick the interesting new physics signatures out from the many, many sort of run-of-the-mill standard model events that ultimately occur when you collide protons together in the LHC. And um, this challenge of picking out the interesting new physics uh, signatures is something that theorists uh, and high-energy experimentalists spend a lot of, t of their time trying to sort out. <clears throat> As I mentioned, with my collaborators, Catherine Zurich and Ian Wu Kim, I recently took on such a prog uh, prob project of figuring out how best to identify events at the LHC involving a non-standard model particle that might explain the forward-backward asymmetry at the Tevatron. To say it a bit differently, theorists came up with a set of new theories to explain the top forward-backward asymmetry. The LHC is producing lots of data and what we've done is made a bridge that will help experimentalists mine their data at the LHC for evidence for or against these new theories. <clears throat> um, so our main results in this uh, study are summarized in this plot, which I don't have time to explain in detail. Uh, but our basic conclusion is that, sort of generically speaking, any top flavor violating model that could explain the Tevatron forward-backward asymmetry can be ruled out or discovered at the LHC uh, before it shuts down for its upgrade in 2012. So uh, models explaining the top forward-backward asymmetry are just one set of new physics models that the LHC will be able to discover or rule out in a short period of time. In fact, the LHC will have something to say about many other well-motivated models beyond the standard model in a matter of, of months. So I'm grateful to the folks that are responsible for making the LHC work, and I feel privileged to be able to see and help sort out its new results so early in my career. <clears throat> I'm kind of spoiled in that respect. <laughs> uh, and the potential of the LHC to discover interesting new physics looks great from my perspective. Thanks.
Saturday Morning Physics is sponsored by the M. Lewis Tiffany Endowment, the Hideko Tomazawa Endowment, the Physics Department, and by gifts from friends of the program.